Yes, sir. Uh, what other uh, aims do the powers have uh, about dividing up the Middle East? Uh, they were seeking empires there, or was, was oil discovered at that time? No, it's very interesting. Oil, oil was, I'm glad you raised the question of oil. Oil was very interesting because oil was not, basically, an important component of this uh, negotiating process at all. Remember, oil wasn't discovered in Saudi Arabia until the 1920s, until after the treaty was, was already uh, well written and, and enforced. Um, there was oil, World War I was the first war that was fought at all using petroleum products. Um, but, you know, we had the first fledgling airplanes, uh, they weren't very much, but they were biplanes or, you know, small planes that were you know, flying around. Um, who had some mechanized uh, units, uh, not very many. Uh, but basically all of the power, major powers had sources of oil that they felt were sufficient to them for a considerable period of time in the future. Um, the United States never thought it would need more oil when they could take on Texas, for instance. Um, and and um, the British and the French got a lot of their oil from a place like Romania and so on. Um, no one really thought of the Middle East as an important oil preserve uh, until much later on. So oil was not an important part. What was an important part was, was just was territory and trade routes. Um, and, and when the British divided, the British and the French divided up in the Middle East in the sykes picot agreement, um, each one got territory that they wanted and needed for their own reasons. Uh, the French wanted very much wanted uh, Lebanon, portions of Syria, and so on, partly because, or largely because, um, they had a large economic stake in that in those regions, and their missionaries were very important. French missionaries in that part of the world were very important to the French government. Um, and, and ironically, one of the reasons why Wilson was so prepared to go along with um, the divisions of the sykes picot agreement, which had not been known to him, it was a secret agreement for him during the war, um, Sykes and Picot being a British and, and French diplomat, respectively, who divided up the, the world. Um, the reason Wilson was prepared to go along with that was that he was very involved in the missionary world. Uh, he believed deeply in missionaries. His father was a a Presbyterian minister. Uh, he grew up, um, you know, passionate devotee of, of religion and um, and, and, and growing in world politics and so on. Uh, I guess today, you know, if you were a politician in America, you would have been called a born again Christian, if you will. Um, but that was very important. For him. So the territory that they wanted, that they wanted, a they wanted the trade routes, and b they wanted things like um, control of the missionaries, uh, control of the holy places in um, in in, um, in Jerusalem. Um, and for the rest of the Middle East, they just wanted to make sure that they had access to it. Um, remember, the Middle East before the war was the Ottoman Empire. It was a vast, um, vast uh, area, region of the world, uh, controlled from Constantinople, Istanbul, by the Ottoman Turks. Um, and, and the outlying regions, um, areas like, well, as far as really originally North Africa and Egypt, but certainly all the way down to Mesopotamia, uh, what is now Saudi Arabia, all the way down to the Trucia states, the, um, the Emirates. Uh, all that was controlled um, by, the, um, by the Ottoman Empire. Uh, the Ottoman Empire picked the wrong side during the war. They picked the, the German side. So they, uh, they were the losers. Um, and and what, um, what the Allies wanted to make what do, they wanted to break up all of these empires. They broke up the Austro-Hungarian Empire, remember. They broke up um, the Ottoman Empire. And they broke up eventually, of course, they broke up Germany, they tried to destroy Germany. They wanted to make sure that these could not be reassembled again in the future. And, and when they broke it up in this fashion, they also wanted to make sure that, again, they had control of these regions for their own purposes, to get their, their goods, their, their troops, and their material and supplies across, in the British case, across Mesopotamia and that part of the Middle East to, um, to the subcontinent, to India. That was very important to them. And, and of course, also at the same time to control the a left hand, at least, of the Suez Canal. Um, so all of these things were, were parts of that equation. Oil, not so much, because again, they didn't really realize there was any oil. In fact, if they thought there was any raw material in Saudi Arabia, they thought it might be gold. That's where the myth was, that King Solomon's mines were located in Saudi Arabia. Of course, they found those things that didn't exist, but um, that was the one issue that they thought might be interesting in Saudi Arabia, and not black gold. Yes, you mentioned that you felt that uh, microstates would then be sort of logical answer in uh, Yugoslavia and now in Iraq. But my understanding of the population distribution is that they aren't in fact need pockets of population, and that particularly in Baghdad, for example, there's a, it's very heavily marbled, you know, uh, and that ethnic cleansing to get back to microstates wouldn't be practical. Do, do you feel that uh, there's anything to 
if you were to go down into microstates, you know, what's to stop them carrying on dividing, dividing, and dividing until you are now to sort of pass that off countries? Right, well, well I, I understand what you're saying, and, and um, that is a very interesting point. I, I think the best way to illustrate that is to go back to what happened in the subcontinent when India and Pakistan were created when the, when the British pulled out. Um, this was also heavily marvel, remember. We had the Muslims, we had the Hindus, and so on. Uh, the idea was to create a Muslim state in, in Pakistan and a Hindu state in, in India. Um, the result was that millions of people migrated back and forth on both sides of the frontier. Um, and, and ultimately today, in fact, if you go to the, uh, the Punjab, for instance, um, you'll, you'll find uh, large numbers of, of, of Muslims in, in India um, on, the, in, in the, on the Indian side and large numbers of Hindus on, on the, in Lahore and that area on the other side in Pakistan. Um, they've learned to live with each other. But for the most part, the countries are relatively homogeneous in that respect. I can see the same thing happening ultimately in, um, in, uh, in Iraq. I can see people, families, and so on shifting back. But remember, <clears throat> these countries were not real nation states ever before. Um, before, well before World War I, they were basically tribes. And they were migrating across vast reaches of the desert, looking for water, looking for early oases, and so on. It was really only at the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, that really the urban conglomerations began. Um, and, and even then, uh, many of that was relatively, um, relatively homogeneous. So I think that there will be microstates, and I think there will be continued fragmentation. In fact, that's likely to be the subject of my next book. I tend to the title is called Raging Nations. It's the arrival of the microstate as a new world organization. Look, when, when the Soviet Union broke up, we had 10 countries come out of that. I can see 20, 30 years from now, 20 countries in what was once the Soviet Union. Um, I can see seven, certainly already we see seven countries in, in Yugoslavia. Uh, I can certainly see three in, in, in Iraq. And, and the organization, though, um, outside of those individual countries is very interesting. You have, for instance, now, a lot of these countries on the fringes of Europe, Czech Republic, Slovakia, uh, Croatia, Slovenia, and so on. These are all becoming part of the overall European community. So while they retain their, their individual identity um, and their, their homogeneity, they become a group together of larger regional groups, either for self-protection, for economic prosperity, trade, and, and that sort of thing. And I can see that happening in the Middle East, for instance, you have the, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC, which now includes basically uh, the old Shushan states, the Emirates, and so on, along the, um, along the Persian Gulf and Saudi Arabia. Well, I can see certainly adding, say, three new countries and what was once Iraq to that. And, and, and so on. So you have these regional groupings that are becoming the way the new world will be organized, but at the same time allowing people to live in a country that's basically populated by their kind, if you will. And, and I think that will work. The most effective organization.